know the scientific glory of professor steven weinberg and uh, his personal you know uh, uh, um, uh, uh, with professor steinberg uh, who are working with professor steven weinberg and his uh, um, contribution in the field of high energy physics and overall in science so before we begin uh, just we have so many students also in the audience so i would like to say few words about our speaker today so professor fernando cuvedo was born in 1956 in costa rica uh, and obtained his uh, early uh, education in guatemala he obtained his phd from the university of texas at austin in 1986 under the supervision of nobel laureate professor steven weinberg then he worked at many places he worked at cern switzerland at mcgill university in canada then in ipn in also in switzerland los alamos national lab in usa and at the national autonomous university of mexico he later joined the department of applied mathematics and theoretical physics at the university of cambridge uk in 1998 he was appointed director of the abdul salam international center for theoretical physics ictp in october 2009 and worked there till 2019 he played an important role during the this 10 years at ictp to enhance the academic visibility of ictp and to have a vibrant visitor program at the ictp to specially help the scientist from the developing countries he always encourage scientists from the developing countries to come to the ictp and organize various scientific activities and i will not forget you know the help he extended to me when he organized an workshop on neutrinos at ictp he played an important role to showcase the importance of international research institution for science diplomacy through his involvement with the ictp during his mandate ictp expanded its horizons by creating new institutes worldwide such as ictp saifr in brazil and eaifr in rwanda new research areas such as quantitative life sciences and renewable energies new education programs such as the international master in medical physics and new outreach projects such as physics without frontiers professor kubedo has made fundamental contributions in the field of supersymmetry extra dimensions and cosmology of string theory he has suggested how to confront string theory scenarios with experiments he has written more than 150 well known papers covering various aspects of high energy physics having more than 16000 citations and a an h index of 72 he has won several awards and recognitions just to name a few the royal society wilson research merit award john solomon guggenheim foundation fellowship the abdul salam medal for the world academy of sciences the spirit of salam award ictp prize and many others sir we would like to congratulate you for winning the prestigious 2021 john whitley award from the american physical society this award has been given to him for his sustained commitment and achievement in the advancement of physics and science in developing countries so with these words i would like to request professor kuvedo to deliver his colloquium on the life and scientific glory of professor steven weinberg thank you sir well, thank you thank you very much sanjeev for such a nice introduction i really feel overwhelmed by all your words thank you very much and thank you all of you for attending to my talk um since a special talk for me because uh, uh, It was very sad to hear about uh, uh, Professor Weinberg's departure a few months ago, uh, <clears throat> and uh, I just managed to send him an email be three days before he passed away, uh, and I, I knew he was he was he was sick, and um, <clears throat> so it's, it's um, he meant a lot 
to me in my career in general. So uh, it, it is an honor and a pleasure to talk about him in this, in this uh, presentation. Uh, I'm actually writing a paper with my collaborators from all times, uh, uh, Cliff Borges, who was also his student, and we decided to dedicate it to, to Steve Weinberg, and, and we say for him to be the standard model of all physicists, essentially. So in that sense, the word standard model here has a double meaning, the, the meaning for that we all mean, and also the, the meaning that he is a model for all of us uh, as a physicist, because uh, his career is just outstanding. <clears throat> so let me try to, to convey a little bit, and I know that the audience uh, <clears throat> is uh, mostly students, so uh, please excuse me if if if, if uh, the level is 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 is, uh, is not uh, the appropriate for 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 many of my colleagues, but uh, we'll try to to be as as uh, as as uh, as comprehensive as possible. So the standard model uh, it is summarized here in this <clears throat> simple uh, slide. Uh, is a, is a, people can say it's probably one of the greatest achievements of humankind, essentially, and just to reduce essentially every single thing that we can observe uh, to very few particles and interactions, which are also mediated by particles. And uh, the particles are the, the, the quarks and the leptons, the quarks make the, 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 the protons and neutrons, by themselves make the, the nuclei of atoms, and the, the electron is one of the leptons, um, <clears throat> and then together make all the periodic table. The neutrino is not uh, making any, any of, of the particles of, of the atoms that we know, but the neutrinos are very important. They are produced in the sun. And uh, <clears throat> well, Sanjeev is an expert, and we have many experts in the audience. Um, and and uh, um, they're the essential part of the standard model. And, uh, and then there is the Higgs, who was just discovered only a few years ago. <clears throat> I, I share with uh, Rohini the excitement to be present at CERN that they, they, it was announced in 2012. Um, and, and then the mediators of the interactions, which are three, what we call gauge interactions, the electromagnetic, the, the weak, and, uh, and the strong interactions. The photon is the mediator of the uh, electromagnetic interactions that we all know. Um, then the Ws and Zs mediate the weak interactions that are important. When people will ask at any time how the soul is burning, we have to mention that these particles Ws and Z. They happen to be massive, uh, and that the interaction is short term, uh, <clears throat> and 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 that that is uh, one of the reasons that, that the Higgs is, was in, introduced to give a mass to, uh, to 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 explain these weak interactions and to explain why the, the corresponding mediators have a mass. And then we have the gluons, which are uh, uh, are also massless, but they are confined in, into in, in, with, together with the quarks in the in the in the protons and neutrons and all the particles that interact with the strong interactions. <clears throat> and on top of that, we have the, the graviton. The graviton has, uh, uh, is different because it has spin two. The other ones, the other interactions are mediated by particles of spin one, and the matter particles are spin one half. The spin the the Higgs is unique because it's the simplest one with the spin zero. And we don't have more more than this, which is interesting. <clears throat> okay. Um, Note that we start with one half, zero, one, and two. We skip three halves that could have been uh, some integer. And I may say something later on. And but we don't have anything below beyond two. Okay. So now that's that's the picture of the standard model, and the basic of that is is the symmetries which are. In, besides the symmetries of special relativity, which are just uh, rotations, translations, and boosts, uh, space-time uh, uh, symmetries, we have internal symmetries, which are the gauge interactions, SU3 color, SU2 left, and, and U1. Okay, so that, that's, that's the picture of the standard model. Very good. So now, with that in mind, I will start talking about the contributions of, uh, of Steven Weinberg uh, on this and, and, and beyond. So, and uh, it is his contribution is amazing because it's expanded over eight decades, and I will go decade by decade. So 1950s, he was a very young person, and he already made contributions. Uh, I have here papers that I have been uh, mentioned. Each of the papers are called renowned papers. That means that they have over 500 citations each, and. Uh, 
and I couldn't take all of them, of course, so I, I, it's less than half that I will mention here, just to give you a, a perspective of, of, of the career of, of, of Weinberg, that he made so many contributions. So already in the 50s, these are two of, the, of his, um, uh, these papers of these uh, renowned papers, in written in 59 and 58. These are general theorems on quantum field theory and weak interactions. The uh, point that I wanted to, to mention is that he already mentioned Salam and Dyson, uh, Salam in particular, that he said that Salam had an uh, impact in his career, and, and this already, he's generalizing some aspects of Salam in, in uh, dealing with renormalization of uh, field theories in general. So, <clears throat> then the 60s, big paper. Uh, again, there was this connection with uh, Salam and Weinberg. Weinberg uh, decided to go for a year at, uh, at Imperial College, and Salam hosted him there. And uh, he discussed with Salam this important result that Goldstone had uh, discussed uh, uh, previously, and actually Weinberg was talking with Goldstone at MIT. They came out with how to generalize this argument, and uh, then uh, he went to, 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 to Imperial College, and then they wrote this paper, which is a classic, of course. Is a, the idea is the following, is that here I have a, a potential like the one I was showing you for the Higgs. You look at the, this, this potential has a symmetry, this, uh, like, a, uh, like, a, uh, like the symmetry of a circle. And this also has a symmetry, the same kind of symmetry. The difference is that here the minimum is symmetric, is the, is the, is the zero, say, so is the point. Whereas here the, the symmetric point is not a minimum, but a maximum. And there, uh, the minimum actually is, is not symmetric because there's a whole circle here. And that's what we call that the symmetry is broken. And uh, the mass of the corresponding particle described by the Higgs is measured by the curvature of the potential at the minimum. And uh, so here's a massive particle because in, the curvature is not zero in all directions. Whereas here, in, in one direction, is, there is a curvature, but in the other direction is flat, and that shows that the, the particle, cor the corresponding particle is massless. So you have two particles because it's two dimensions. The one is massive and the other is, is massless. And that is what is called a Goldstone boson. <clears throat> and uh, so what Weinberg, Salam, and Goldstone proved here is, is the general result. So whenever you have a global symmetry, you have to have, uh, if the symmetry is broken, which is this case, then you have to have massless particles, and and and, and uh, exactly massless particles, which are equal to modes. This was a bad result in some sense because it, it says that we could not just impose any symmetries in in, in nature or in internal symmetries, because then you have to pay the price to have these massless particles, and then um, <clears throat> they are not same in nature. So that means that all this all these theories in principle will not make sense. Of course, this was uh, later on addressed by, by Higgs and, and others uh, by saying that, that okay, the, the symmetry is local, there is an extra field, which is the, 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 the spin one field, like the photon, and then this field will, uh, when the symmetry is broken, gets a mass, and the, the way it gets a mass is that it absorbs the corresponding goes to the mode into, into a massive uh, uh, particle, so that addresses, that solves this problem. <clears throat> okay, so that was first great paper in the 60s. The second one, I will spend a few minutes here because and, and, uh, this, I, I find this an amazing result. This is one of the, you know, again, a young person like Weinberg, 31 years old, he comes out with this very naive and simple argument. You have you have a scattering of particles, bunch of particles coming in, bunch of particles coming out, they interact in the middle. And then they, he said, well, what about if at each uh, external leg I add photon, uh, a very a very soft photon, he said, uh, that means that, that, that the momentum is very, very small. And I can add them at the, in the leg, since the momentum is very small, you can just essentially create this, this, this particle can, can exist. And I say photon, but it can be any particle of spin one, uh, massless. And then you can have it to any leg, to the internal legs, and uh, to the incoming and the outgoing legs, to all of them. So using just principles of uh, of um, special relativity and quantum mechanics, of course, only that. <clears throat> and the fact that the corresponding particles is being one, you have that, that, that if it is massless, has only two degrees of freedom. <clears throat> he comes out that once you describe these interactions, at the end, all these amplitudes, which are complicated, in principle will be f so will, will, will depend on, on will be related to this original amplitude times something that that, that has to uh, vanish 
if you want to preserve uh, uh, the symptoms of special relativity upon kind of invariance. And this comes out as a con this connection, this condition, which is Fi0 minus Fi0, the incoming and the outgoing particles. This quantity Fi it measures the interaction, and zero means that it's a zero momentum. That's the interaction of the, of the photons with the corresponding particles. That can be electrons or so. So essentially, there is this a conserved charges, a conserved quantity, that the sum of the incoming equal to the sum of the outgoing. And that's precisely what the charge is, the, the interaction measured by the charge. So this is a, a statement or a proof, a general proof of charge conservation. So this is a, just tells you that charge conservation just comes from the basic uh, theory that you have to have symmetry of special relativity and the, the existence of, of, of uh, spin one particles, which are uh, massless like the photon. And so the corresponding interaction has to have charges and the charges uh, is conserved. So that's very, it's very elegant proof of charge conservation. Then he said, well, what about if the incoming uh, or the, uh, the particle that you attach to it is not a spin one, but let's take a spin two, massless spin two. <clears throat> People have thought already, fears and probably that the massless spin two may mediate uh, like the gravitational interactions. And precisely that's what Weinberg discovered. You say that that you have spin two here. He, he has the same, uh, he played the same game as before, but now uh, since the spin two particle has two indices, the, the corresponding interaction will have two indices, like here you have only one index, gamma mu. Uh, so the condition is not the same, of, but you have this condition, with, uh, the corresponding interactions times the momenta, minus the same interactions times the momenta equal to zero. So the incoming and outgoing. So the, but <clears throat> he says, well, there's already a quantity that is conserved, a, a linear in momenta, which is the momentum itself that is conserved. And we cannot have more because otherwise the interaction will, will, will you, you will reduce even the dimensionality of, 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 the, of, of, the, of, of the space where this particle will be moving. So that means that all the only way to make this consistent with the conservation momentum, which is already valid, is that all of these uh, charges or, so, are equal to, are all the same. So contrary to the charges QI, I, it was for, for each particle, you can have a different charge. Here, all the particles have to send the, the same charge. And that's precisely the proof of the, the principle of equivalence. So essentially, you can prove all these things that, that uh, Einstein was thinking when discovering general relativity. Uh, Weinberg could derive it by just this simple uh, uh, game of playing with Feynman diagrams uh, and only imposing the basic theme, symmetries, special relativity, and that's it. And, and of course, quantum mechanics. So, and of course, the, once you have the principle of equivalence, then you can see that the whole uh, um, general relativity should be emerging. Of course, Weinberg didn't stop there. He said, well, what about uh, you have particles of higher spin, uh, masses of higher spin, so you have more indices here. And then this, these conditions will have different, more powers of momenta, and you cannot satisfy this equation, these conditions. So he's essentially, he proved that you have to stop in two. Uh, there, is no, there are no interactions of, uh, mediated by uh, massless particles of spin higher than two. And then we are stuck now with only the spin one and spin two as mediators and interactions, and those are the ones that we know from the standard model. So this is a outstanding uh, uh, general result that Weinberg proved in, in, the, in the early 60s. And that this comes on the name soft theorems that is becoming very popular in, in recent years. <clears throat> then already before QCD started, he, he found some uh, some rules, so relationships between the masses and so on, different particles that are still uh, valid and satisfied. Uh, he came out with this, uh, this uh, chiral perturbation theory, essentially thinking about, about uh, the, the, remember the, the, the Goldstone theorem that you have to have, so you have an exact global symmetry, you have to have massless particles. He said, well, if the symmetry is not exact, and there are symmetries, at that time there were symmetries which were not exact, like, like uh, isospin or, or the Eiffel way or so, uh, and then if the symmetry is not exact, then the corresponding boson is not necessarily massless, or it's light, it has to be light. And that's how he came out with, with the scalar perturbation theory in the sense that the pions are particularly light compared to the other hadrons. <clears throat> and he, he proposed them to be uh, pseudo Goldstone bosons. That means that almost Goldstone bosons, but not quite because they're not totally massless. So in that sense, they were still used to the idea of, of, of the Goldstone theorem. And then comes his uh, model of leptons. Uh, I always say that, you know, uh, Leonardo was uh, one of the greatest painters in, in history but he also needed his Mona Lisa. So this is the Mona Lisa of Weinberg, I would say, even though he may not be, he may not have been the deepest of his papers. He is the most successful one. And so in this paper is three pages or less than three pages. He essentially 
is revolutionized uh, uh, physics in many respects. Essentially, at that time, 1967, people only knew how to describe the electromagnetic interactions. That was the only interaction people could describe. Describe by Tomonaga, Schwinger, and, and Feynman in the, in the late 40s. <clears throat> it was a mystery to describe the weak, the strong interactions, and even less the gravity. So, in, in this paper, Weinberg proposed using the Higgs mechanism, uh, the, the idea of, of, the, of uh, having local symmetries, to, to describe the weak interactions. And precisely the Higgs mechanism, as I said, it gives masses to the particles. So, at the end, the mediators will get a mass, and those are. Uh, the mediators of, of the weak interaction, but he not not only managed to describe the weak interactions, which is a big result by itself. He described it in a way that it unified the weak interaction with the electromagnetic interactions. <clears throat> so in that sense, it goes at, at one step, like following the tradition of Newton unifying gravity on Earth with gravity in space, and Maxwell unifying electri electricity and magnetism. This is the next step. So this is how big it will be seen in the history of science. You unify two otherwise uh, different interactions, which are the weak and the electromagnetic interactions in one single interaction. <clears throat> and, and then he made concrete predictions, predictions that there were the so-called neutral currents mediated by the particle, which is neutral. We know the Z particles. And then he predicted then the corresponding particles, W plus, W minus, and Z. I cannot forget the day that uh, he was lecturing in quantum field theory in, in, in Austin when I was a student. And he came to the class very excited, telling us that they, they had just told him from CERN that uh, they had discovered the W particles. <clears throat> so you can see the feeling all the students felt, and I can imagine his own feeling that, uh, at that, that moment. Um, and then, of course, he predicted the Higgs. The Higgs that was discovered in 2012 uh, is, is 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 the Higgs that one predicted. It's, it's not you know Higgs and and Angler and others. They had made up the, a, a general theory of 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 of, uh, of lo local symmetry being broken, and they can have many, there can be many Higgses, and actually may they may be discovered many Higgses, but the Higgs that was discovered at CERN is the Higgs predicted in this paper by Weinberg. Of course, all of us know that. Uh, subsequently, Salam wrote a similar paper, and that's how they share the Nobel Prize in 1979. <laughs> okay, so that's 60s, 70s. Uh, he entered also uh, the, the, his contribution to QCD, to strong interactions. Mm. Essentially, in this paper, also one of these renowned papers, uh, there was a discussion, uh, you know, that, that uh, <clears throat> at that time, um, Gross, Wilczek, and, and Polister had proved what is called uh, asymptotic freedom. That is essential that the the, the the strength of the of the of the strong interactions decreases with energy, and that is that is a, a, a good indication that why the quarks are confined. But it was not very clear that the the who, who were the mediators of these interactions, the strong interactions. And, and and people even were thinking that that uh, they were massive, like the W's and the Z. But in the in this paper, uh, Weinberg said, well, the, the quarks are confined, but also the mediators in the direction, the gluons themselves, uh, are also confined. So they can be massless, but confined. So the the, the interactions, the strong interactions, are of, of short range, not because the the mediators are massive, but because the mediators are confined, and they are confined because of, of the interactions being strong. And this is the standard picture you want to split. Two quarks at the end, you cannot split the quarks, but you can only get a quark, quark anti uh, quark, and another quark anti quark uh, interacting through the gluons. So the, both the gluons and the quarks are confined. Okay, in the 70s also, something his early contribution to string theory, we can say that uh, he came out with a, a nice paper with one on the limiting temperature in, 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 in nature. You have the number of degrees of freedom is, is increases. Exponentially, and that's what happens in string theory, and that is what is called uh, the Hagedorn temperature. And this is one of the big results in string theory. It will be expected at that temperature something will happen, so it's phase transition. So, and it was estimated and, and proposed by Weinberg and one in that paper. Uh, again, with the high temp with finite temperature, he described quantum field theory at finite temperature. So, this is this is the classical paper together with the paper of Jakiv and, and, and P. Uh, they were more, more essentially at the same time, uh, and essentially he described there uh, how a high temperature, a symmetry that that is broken at low temperature. If you increase the temperature, 
the temperature adds a term in the, in the scalar potential that that uh, <clears throat> there is like a positive mass term that if, if the temperature is high enough, the minimum becomes symmetric. And the temp when it cools down, the minimum is not symmetric. So essentially, this is nice because you can think that that even though we are living in a, in a phase of broken symmetry, maybe in the early universe when the symmetry the, the temperature was very high, the symmetry can be restored. I'm talking about uh, symmetry being restored. This is another classic, the George Quinn and Weinberg paper. Uh, at that time, Salam and Patti had uh, proposed that you can go beyond the standard model now and unify also the lesser of interactions with the strong interactions in, 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 a, in a bigger symmetry. And then uh, Georgia and Glashio also came out with a, a, being a, a, a simple group to do that. But the, course, the concrete calculations, typical of Weinberg, that you can do on that is to well, take the interactions, electromagnetic, weak and strong, that are the energies that we were measure, they were they all look very different, one very strong, the other one much weaker, and so on. But um, with what is called the normalization group, they all evolve. So the strong interactions evolve, they get weaker and weaker and weaker, that's the asymptotic freedom. But the other two interactions also evolve, and they computed that there should be uh, energy where the three of them merge. And in that energy, you expect a theory which is really unified with the, the strong electronic interactions, <clears throat> and hopefully with a single gauge coupling, with a single coupling. And so that, that's how what, what it, it will it will hit here. This is still uh, after the results of LEP in the nineties. Still, the only hope we have of, of the, the uh, indication that that uh, that uh, uh, this is happening if you add to to the standard model some supersymmetry, some special. Uh, particles which are <coughs> partners of, of the standard model particles and and you have that uh, those extra particles actually the the three couples unify <clears throat> okay then he with the student gildener uh, make clear what what we call now the hierarchy problem why the higgs mass uh, is is, uh, is now we know it's 125 gv uh, but why is too much smaller than a typical mass for instance you the uh, uh, you expect heavier states at higher energies, in particular at, up to the Planck scale, uh, and we know that the Higgs mass uh, is, is ten to uh, is fifteen orders of magnitude smaller than the Planck scale. So, and the Higgs coupling to other particles will get a mass. Uh, this the contribution of other particles like the quarks and so on will uh, contribute to the mass of the Higgs, and it will make it larger and larger and larger, depending on how heavy the, these particles are, depending on what is the cutoff. <clears throat> And so then to, to prevent the Higgs from getting bigger, the mass bigger, getting bigger and bigger, there has to be some fine tuning. And this is what is the, the hierarchy problem. <clears throat> Again, supersymmetry in principle will have will have addressed this problem by having particles, bosons and fermions contributing in different ways, canceling each other. But unfortunately, supersymmetry has not been seen at LAC. So this is still a, an open an open question. And, uh, and Weinberg was behind uh, pointing it out. He was also behind. One of the, the the second most popular um, solution of that problem, which is thinking that the, the, the there will be a, a, another interaction we call technicolor, maybe beyond color. Uh, what actually, it was called technicolor by Soskin, I think, because there was a parallel paper by Soskin. <clears throat> when and the idea was that if the Higgs was composite, I think the, the idea is very nice because uh, uh, this is similar to say superconductivity where the symmetry is broken by a, by a Cooper pair of, of, of electrons so you expect that maybe there will be some pair of, of some fermions that, that that will be composing the Higgs but uh, and, and that will address very nicely the hierarchy problem however this is not uh, favored by experiments he also uh, with B Beng Li who was his best friend and then unfortunately died in a car accident uh, he had several papers, but in particular this one, putting bounds on neutrino masses through cosmology, which I think is one of the important papers in cosmology, written of those years. And then he, in a collaboration with Sturman, uh, had this uh, uh, idea, proposal of how to detect the quarks, if the quarks are <coughs> are confined. So the way to detect them is through jets. So you can see when you, you, uh, electrons and positrons collide, or, or, or in general collide, you can produce uh, quarks and anti-quarks. But there, then they, they they will produce since they are confined to hadrons. At the end, you will see jets of of hadrons of particles of strong interactions, and then you have uh, gluons. You have three, three jets. But as I said, that that's that's a, a classic paper of Berman and Weinberg, and that's how people 
of announced I mean, the discovery of, of the people believe in the the quartz because of, of all this evidence through jets. Now again, going beyond the standard model, uh, he predicted a, a new particle called axions. And that's a nice story also. Uh, Peche and Queen came out with this idea. There was something called the strong CP problem. You have the the, the um, this coupling allowed in, in, in the strong interaction, which is the corresponding field strength of, of the gauge interaction. <clears throat> and this parameter theta is a free parameter. But this coupling itself will contribute very uh, much to, to the to the to the uh, magnetic moment of the neutron, and then that 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 the observation still that that if that contributes uh, it is it, not what is seen, and so that means that put a, a, a bound on the on this parameter to be less than ten to minus ten, and that's what is called the strong CP problem. Peche and Queen propose that it can be you put here uh, a field, and then the minimum of that potential of the field uh, will set the natural to zero, and then that solves the strong CP problem. Um, uh, Helen Quinn, talking to Helen Quinn, she tells the story about this. Uh, she said that she, they both, Pecci and Quinn, went to talk to Weinberg before they wrote the paper. And uh, and they had an idea, but once Weinberg uh, mentioned to them what the problem was, they understood that, that they had not understood the problem themselves. So they went back to their office, came back and came up with a proposal and wrote the paper. And the paper was just just, just proposing that, that, that this can be that this uh, this mechanism to set theta to be small. But then Weinberg called uh, Helen and I said, "Well, did you realize that there's a new particle there if you have this mechanism?" And Helen confessed, "Well, actually, we didn't realize." So Weinberg said, "Okay, so then I will write the paper by myself." So he wrote his paper, and this is a classic. I think so actions are the, one of the best candidates for dark matter and one of the particles that people have been searching for in the last 40, 50 years, and uh, we hope that they will be discovered soon. Another big thing that he did in the 70s is effective field theories. <clears throat> effective field theories is, uh, is, is, is our way of understanding nature, essentially, and our way of understanding field theories. Um, so if you talk about the standard model, uh, the, you can like find be a, a scalar field. So you write, <clears throat> you have like a Lagrangian. Lagrangian has to have dimension four because you have to integrate over d4x to get something dimensionless that that, that, that will give you the action uh, you, that you have to divide by h bar or so. Um, and so um, uh, then there is a difference. Of the, uh, you can classify the 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 interactions by different dim dimensionality. So if you have here the kinetic term of the corresponding phi. So the scalar field has dimension one in four dimensions. The derivative was uh, one of the derivative give you another dimension one, then another one, another one. So this has dimension four. So that's that's correct. So the, the corresponding coefficient has no dimensions. Here phi has dimension two, so you have to multiply by something of dimension two. That's a mass term, and 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 then you have something dimension three. So you have to have something in dimension one, and then you have dimension four. Then you, then you have to the corresponding lambda has dimension uh, no dimensions. After dimension four have five, six, and so on, then the corresponding coupling has to have come with the inverse powers of masses. And this is the scale lambda we call. Okay, so up to dimension four, that we call renormalizable, because once you do the quantization at the end, all you have a finite number of, of coefficients and they can all be uh, renormalized. So, so it can be reabsorbed in a finite number of terms. And, and then and then you can make predictions because there's all, all uh, very few free parameters and many of several observations. So at the end, you can fix the parameters. One, but once you have non-normalizable interactions, then then you, you you have to have an infinite number of them. And then the theory is less predictive. But that's not the end of the story. Weinberg emphasized that uh, all these non-normalizable theories are also good, are also good as long as you're uh, talking about the scales, uh, energies smaller than this power lambda. Because then, then that means that this all these terms will be much more surprised compared to the other ones. Okay, and you want to keep a precision of, of order, so the corresponding mass over lambda. Then you keep this term, and then you neglect the quadratic uh, dependence, and so on. So, so depending on how much precision you want, you will start adding these terms. This looks like a very simple uh, a, a kind of uh, calculation technique, but it's very deep in the sense that then you can see that renormalizable theories are very good. Non-renormalizable theories are also good as long as you treat them as effective for theories. They will not be a fundamental uh, UV complete theory. 
most effective field is valid at uh, any energies below a certain, a certain limit. And so that means that, that uh, you can deal with them. In particular, gravity, you can deal with it also, uh, even though it's not normalizable because uh, uh, you can just, uh, once you talk about energy scale relatively small, you can start adding uh, contributions which are higher and higher and get all the precision, uh, all the precision you want. Okay, so that's, that's it. Uh, like a vision kind of uh, understanding physics through the scales and that's uh, when Bers has this, this mark there. Precisely using these ideas, he considered this uh, going beyond the standard model. Uh, in the standard model, something happens which is very curious is that since it is renormalizable, uh, you have symmetries that you didn't ask for. So you, you put the original symmetry, so you three, you two, and you one, and that's it. But if you write the most general Lagrangian, which is normalizable, it has extra symmetries, like a volume number, why the, uh, the number of variance and number of leptons is, 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 is conserved. So that's a symmetry of, this, of the standard model Lagrangian that nobody asks, it's an accidental symmetry. The same thing about lepton number, the number of uh, leptons, which are electrons and, uh, and neutrinos and so on. Um, but then if you start adding non normalizable contributions, this accidental symmetries may not happen. So for instance, he classified the dimension five operator, you know, one, uh, the parameters one over the mass. So you have a coupling H, H, I mean Higgs, Higgs, neutrino, neutrino. This has dimension five, so you have to put one over uh, mass because it's three halves, three halves, one and one. Um, so, and then he said, well, but neutrino, so you, if the Higgs has a vacuum expectation value, this, this, this number is, is different from zero and that will induce a mass to the neutrinos. How big the mass is, it will be depending on the, the ratio of the, of, the, of the vacuum expectation value of the Higgs squared divided by this big mass. And since we know that the neutrinos are very light, that puts a bound on how this uh, fundamental scale mass is, is 10 to the 14 GeV or so, it has to be of that order or more. Okay, so essentially, this is very simple. From here, you learn, learn a lot. So you, there's something beyond the standard model that induces neutrino masses. It, it, it will happen at scale very large. What about dimension six? Dimension six, he has several, and that in, that in particular, you have quark, 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 uh, lepton, and that uh, induce proton decay. So if proton has some decay, then you also have, now the mass is, is mass square because of dimension six. So that put a bounce on the mass, 10 to the 15 or so. So that uh, also fits very nicely with the unification idea. So. <clears throat> It's very simple ideas uh, uh, and extremely powerful. That's uh, Weinberg's uh, has, has Weinberg's signature in general. And of course, that dimension five operator is called the Weinberg operator. 1980s, he was invited to a special uh, uh, event for celebrating the Einstein centenary. And he came out, so well, you have to say something about gravity also. And he came out with the idea, which is asymptotic freedom, uh, which is uh, essentially say, so, so gravity is, is, is not uh, renormalizable. But if it, if, it, if, if it flows towards a fixed point uh, of, of this renormalization group flow, then uh, you, may, you may stop there and then you can talk, you, you can make a real consistent theory. And that's one of the proposals people are still discussing. Of course, it's not the, the, the leading candidate for the still string, string theory, but uh, he proposed this and still uh, there are com communities working on asymptotic safety as a possibility to describe gravity in, in a consistent way. He entered also the supersymmetry era. And then, as I told you before, the, the, there's a particle of spin three halves that is not mentioned in, in the standard model that we skip from one to the two. And that's the gravitino. It makes sense only you have supersymmetry. And Weinberg was uh, putting this bounce on, on gravitino masses from, from, from cosmology, which is a very influential paper. Then he entered very much the supergravity era. And that's when I was starting to be his student. So I put two papers here. Uh, <clears throat> One for me is is very important because this is the paper he gave me to read when uh, when I started being his student. I had to confess I didn't understand anything about the paper, and uh, even but I had to memorize it within a week to 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 be able to report to him. Fortunately, he was extremely busy that week, and he asked me to talk to his postdoc, who is uh, uh, Joe Licken. And Joe Licken helped me a lot. They wrote this. They were writing this paper together. Then then I discussed with Joe, and he helped me. With my, my what's called qualifying exam to go through the through the uh, to, to to start my, my to be able to be accepted to get my into my PhD, I have to say I was scared at the time because the previous student who was a, a, a one student had failed the exam and he had to leave, so I was I was very nervous. But thank you, thanks to Joe Licken, I, I managed to. We wrote a paper based generalizing this one, and that was my first paper, and that's. Uh, 
how I survived uh, for my first, um, uh, for starting my PhD. <clears throat> I have stories to say about this other paper, but maybe if I have time later on, I will come back to it. Then again, he was asked to, to uh, write something in honor of Nambu, and he came out with this masterpiece. This is a beautiful paper. Essentially, he said, superconductivity now is plain using particle physics methods. So he recognized that particle physics has learned a lot from condensed matter, which is usually the case. But you can also learn condensed matter from particle physics. And he just said, well, what is a superconductor? A superconductor is a material in which uh, the, 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 the symmetry, you, uh, U1 symmetry of, of the electromagnetic interactions is broken, essentially that. On, using that and, and his effective theory uh, 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 technology, he can derive everything. He can derive the, 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 the Meissner effect. Uh, he can derive that the, 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 the system has to have superconductivity. All of these things come out naturally just by assuming the, a broken symmetry U1. It's a beautiful paper. Then in the uh, late 80s, Many people were working in the cosmological constant. People at that time, people thought it was zero, and that was the biggest mystery. We all dreamed as as, as students that this, that would be the problem we would like to solve when we were when we would grow up. Um, and and at that time, there was this what people called Kolemanier. That uh, Sidney Coleman came up with this idea that with the many baby universes, maybe you can explain uh, the, the 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 cosmological constant be zero. And uh, Stephen Hawking had all their ideas, so the whole community was working on that. So Weinberg just uh, <clears throat> giving some lectures in Harvard. He chose, I mean, this this subject, and he wrote the definitive, uh, definitive uh, review on on the issue with a lot of material, uh, uh, original material here. This was, for instance, the famous Weinberg theorem, and so on, that to, to make how difficult it is to to prove that the, using symmetries or scalings or something to 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 get the cosmological constant to be naturally small. Um, and, and that's a major problem. Remember, he had mentioned the hierarchy problem, which we're talking about 10 to the minus 15 or so. Uh, um, but here, the tuning can be 10 to the minus 60. We get to the standard model, but if we go all the way to the Planck scale, the tuning is 10 to the minus 123, which is explaining such a small number. It's totally unnatural. And, and, and this is the, the, the reference to understand what the problem is and what has been done. I'm thinking about that problem. He himself <laughs> came out and said, well, the, the, out of desperation, he said, well, this problem is so difficult. Could it could it have an anthropic uh, explanation? Imagine Steven Weinberg, a famous person, top physicist in the world, Nobel Prize, coming out with these anthropic ideas uh, without any need. To, I mean, when he had to, to, to protect his reputation, I think it uh, shows how brave he was. And uh, and of course, he predicted that if, if there is an anthropic explanation for the for the smallness and the cosmological constant, it has to be different from zero, and it has to be of the order of say 10 to the minus 123, and that's precisely what the observations <coughs> gave ten, 10 years later. Okay, this is very much into the debate, but you can see he didn't mind entering into the debate as long as he's only concentrating on what the physics is, and and, and he didn't like the idea, but he said what it, uh, it, science doesn't have to be in the way that scientists like it. So so you have to be totally objective, and this is uh, evidence of, of his objectiveness. So, and then he came out, uh, he emphasized he was not doing foundations of quantum mechanics at that time. But he wanted to find something that can test it, the, the basis of quantum mechanics, for instance, the, the superposition principle. And so he had a concrete proposals and people have tested, of course it passed, but it was at that level. How is it you can pass on something that can be, can put quantum mechanics itself to test? And, and I think that's a very influential paper. In the 1990s, I, can, I wanted to uh, well uh, go fast now. Uh, he has this effective field theories in nuclear physics. That's totally surprising. He had entered the cosmological constant. He had done a little bit on string theory. He left the string theory. Uh, and then in the 1990s, maybe people were doing some much more ambitious projects. And he came back to something that we had considered, well, a solved issue, which is nuclear physics. But he said, well, nobody has used all the power of effective field theories into uh, uh, nuclear physics. There, there are plenty of observations because the energy is relatively small, and so you can, and and there are few parameters that you can put as as in, in, in the standard effective field theory. So he created a revolution within nuclear physics. This is a classic paper, and many people have been building up their careers based on on this uh, formalism of Weinberg nuclear physics. <clears throat> in the two thousands, he entered uh, well. He has been working in cosmology, so he used effective field theories in cosmology again. 
papers, you know, he was already in his 70s or so, and, and, and starting, and then uh, he was writing, you know, papers with 500 citations or more in cosmology, in effective theory of inflation. That's who he's one of the of the of the, of, 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 of the main person working on this. There's uh, his group and the group uh, of criminalia uh, <clears throat> and and he did it because he was writing a book cosmology. He wanted to have everything under control. Um, and then in the in the late 2000s and uh, I think 2018 or so when I saw him uh, oh, no 13 in 13 um, he had this idea in, he gave a talk here yes he gave a talk here in Imperial College in, uh, support in, in the <clears throat> supporting Kibble uh, when, for his 18th 80th birthday and hopefully people thought at that time Kibble could share part of the, of the Higgs Nobel Prize. But he gave this talk in, in, in Imperial College and he mentioned briefly, he said, well, there's this issue about Delta NF is the effective number of uh, neutrinos uh, that has, is very much constrained uh, uh, by, by observations <clears throat> in, in cosmology, CMB and so on. So which is 3.0 something. So of course the 0 something is because it's the effective number. Is, but since it tells you that there are three neutrinos and maybe some extra things, which is people call dark radiation. So he proposed uh, Goldstone bosons to be uh, that kind of dark radiation. So that's, that's a, that's a, he said, it's not a big idea, but remember if, if, if it is true, uh, I, I said it first. That's a comment he made in that talk. Okay, and then, then now in the 2020s, uh, he still, well, he had this paper, Models of Leptons and Quark Masses, which is very good, because back to standard technology. But he had been uh, working on several things, massless particles in extra dimensions, just uh, 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 last year or so. Foundation of quantum mechanics. Now he entered into the foundation of quantum mechanics because he wrote this textbook on quantum mechanics, and he realized that he didn't like any of the interpretations. So he had been actually working on that uh, as Weinberg style, just going through the whole machinery and he expressed his uh, unhappiness about the state of understanding quantum mechanics. And even he, uh, because of gravitational waves, he entered also into gravitational waves. He had a couple of papers where Raphael Flagler, uh, he was with his last student, uh, they, they were uh, entering to that. So you have extremely active. So I finished papers and then now textbooks. Textbooks, this collection is incredible. It's, it's just, you know, the gravitational and cosmology is a classic in the 1970s. I learned relativity in that book. I have to say because I couldn't understand more mathematical for, uh, formalisms, uh, and I went through in the in in summer uh, throughout this book. It's, 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 it has too many indices, maybe, but it's, uh, it's the kind of thing you can follow as a student uh, and understand it by yourself. Or the the, the the basis of quantum of of, 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 of relativity and gravitation. Uh, <clears throat> then his masterpiece is I would say this quantum field theory, volume one, two, and three. I would say these are the standard reference and will be the standard references for forever, I would say. Mm -hmm. uh, if you want to understand quantum field theory, there's nothing there's, that treats quantum field theory in the most general, formal way that, that, that will work. Uh, they're not the best textbooks, I would say, because they're too difficult. They are too comprehensive. They're good material for the for the lecturers like myself when I do it, uh, because then then this is the place that you, the last resource is when is 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 the, is the source of all the information that he treats everything in the most general way the most complete and he doesn't leave anything anything uh, uh, open so i think these are classical books then he book in cosmology uh, he said that many of the things in cosmology were done numerically and he liked uh, doing things by hand and that's how he came with ideas of effective theories and so on in cosmology it's a beautiful book also uh, more recently, he he went back and said, "Well, lectures in quantum mechanics. Imagine Weinberg lecturing in quantum mechanics while the grads, uh, amazing." And uh, as I say, he he discussed here in, in particular. Well, I think the discussion here on foundation of quantum mechanics is amazing. Then lectures in astrophysics, something unexpected. Again, he wanted to learn a little bit, and he decided to teach. And he had calculations here that people had not done in hundreds of years, and, and you know, things about the stars going around and so on. So it's, uh, concrete calculation that uh, are, are even original in this regard. And the most recent book I received the day he passed away is uh, I recommend it to all the students. It's very nice. Uh, Foundation of Modern Physics. He includes uh, uh, thermodynamics, statistical, statistical uh, mechanics, uh, relativity, quantum mechanics, uh, field theory, and so on. So it's, it's a beautiful book for it's for students of last year undergraduate. So. And then, of course, the popular science books. <laughs> if that was not enough, I mean, popular science, he is the master of popular science books. Uh, had, again, he has another eight books. Um, <clears throat> the first three minutes for me is 
it's an incredible book. Uh, for I, I was very young I, I, before going to, to to Texas as a student, reading that you can talk about the early universe, the first three minutes, and, and be confident with calculations is something that changed anybody's mind. Especially during physics, you said this is amazing how physics can can be that way. He had a nice historical book about the subatomic particles he wrote for Scientific American. It's nice because uh, now that I'm here in Cambridge, uh, since the, the, he based everything in Cambridge because he's where the electron was discovered and Rutherford and so on. So it's a, it's a beautiful uh, a description of all the, the historical aspects of the discovery of all the particles. Then this one, I would say, for me, is, is the book that will remain for many, many, many years. I imagine people uh, 100 years from now talking about oh, how physicists were seeing science in the late 20th century. And this will be the standard reference, I would say, because uh, essentially he puts the, how do we understand science, how do we understand physics in general, and his own ideas. And he, he does, he's not afraid of saying things, uh, how science uh, compared with philosophy or with religion and so on. So uh, it's the view of a scientist uh, uh, in the deepest possible way, I would say, in the 20th century. I think this book is, is classic. And then recently, he liked to be controversial, so he wrote the history of, of, of science, uh, mostly physics, but history, uh, from the eyes of a scientist and not a historian. He said the historians have this prejudice that you cannot judge history based on our principles today, because we cannot say, well, judge someone who had slaves in the past and now we are against slavery because it was the way that they were thinking at the time. Weinberg said, that's okay for history, but for science, no. For science, we know what was correct and we know it was not correct. And you, So who was right and who was wrong? So he, he, he goes through in the, that detail. So he had these uh, comments about the Greeks, which I, I cannot uh, stop mentioning because I, I find it very irreverent. At some point he said, um, uh, Aristotle was very naive and often wrong. So imagine saying that about, about Aristotle. I, I wouldn't have never <laughs> expected anybody saying that. But then he finished the phrase and said, well, at least he was not silly like Plato. So this is, you know, this is such a lack of respect and was only one could say all those things. And then these other books are just the collections of um, short articles he wrote. Each, each one is a beautiful masterpiece. And these are the, the direct lectures he gave here at the beginning, the first direct lectures, he and, and Feynman. So they were recorded as a book. I'm oh, sorry. Um, then to finish, for the students, he, he gave some uh, um, speech for the graduation ceremony in, in McGill University. And he gave four lessons to students, uh, uh, advice for graduate students. And he said, well, nobody knows everything, and you don't have to in order to do research, which is important. The advice is to go for the messes. That's where the action is. So don't go to the clean thing, which everything is solved, because that's already solved. So go where the, so in that sense, he was, at his time, he was comparing particle physics with general relativity, where general relativity was very clean and mathematical, and particle physics was very dirty, because nobody knew so many particles how to describe. So that, that's where the discovery, the, the progress can be made, because the, precisely because the field is ugly. Um, you have to forgive yourself to wasting time. You do calculations, you may, may not be working, but at some point it may be good for you for something in the future. And to learn something about the history of science, he says <clears throat> it's important um, to see how we, what we are doing fit into the whole history of science. In particular, he said that that we as scientists, we are most probably we are not going to get rich. <laughs> and, um, and we as high energy physicists, we are usually um, what we will do will not have much applications, so at least we have we find comfort to be part of all the history uh, of, of, of science. And, and then some personal reminiscences. I will be brief here, and, and uh, his lectures were outstanding. He was my thesis advisor. Uh, he always told me that he felt a bit guilty not to be so close to students. Uh, but uh, he didn't appreciate that we were just by seeing him in action every every week. We had meetings in, in his office with the whole group. Uh, we had to report once in a while, and, and we had to give a talk what we were doing for the whole group. But I, actually, it was it was whoever was talking and, and Weinberg because he was the one asking all the questions, and he was clarifying everything and, and gave, giving suggestions and so. And his intellectual honesty, when he didn't understand something, it was something that, that we, we admire very much. He supported my career, of course, uh, <clears throat> for me to get my jobs and so on. He was always supporting, writing letters and so on. I have always been 
I'm very thankful to him. Well, I have some personal anecdotes that I may say uh, uh, my reserve for later or something and, uh, because I didn't have that much time. He supported ICTP. He was very, very, very close to Salam, even though there were two different personalities. Uh, <clears throat> And uh, but they were good friends, and he was always in support of ICDP. So whatever I asked him to support me in some committees of, or on even lectures or so, uh, he, he 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 always did. Uh, uh, one thing I I will always I, I can even recommend you is that on the seventeenth of October two thousand and seventeen, it was the fiftieth anniversary of his paper when he submitted to to to, to the physical review of his uh, standard model paper. So I asked him to give the talk precisely that day to uh, reminiscence of the standard model. Um, so and he uh, kindly uh, agreed. Of course, he did it online. Um, so the, I recommended that you can go to ICTP's uh, colloquia. It's, it's a beautiful talk. I have to say, I spent 15 minutes introducing him because uh, he never wanted to have a 60 birthday celebration or something. So I said, maybe I, this is my chance. And it's, it's, it took me, what it, what it takes two or three minutes to introduce the speaker. Uh, it took me 15 minutes and I couldn't make justice actually to, to him. Uh, and then we, we ended up uh, with unexpected collaboration. Last year, of, it's a sad occasion. Uh, we joined uh, Rafael Busso uh, to write this uh, biograph biographical memoir of Joe Polchinski, who uh, was also professor in UT when I was a student, and uh, I admired him very, very, very much, and liked him uh, so much. And 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 uh, unfortunately, he passed away. Uh, and and then we joined Steve and Rafael Busso, who was uh, Joe's uh, collaborator, to write this this article for the National Academy <clears throat> last year. There's some memorable talk, quotes. He has many 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 talks uh, he liked to be controversial he has his uh, strong ideas about uh, religion and about uh, philosophy and so on um and uh, some fa famous ones i can say for instance this one i think everybody knows that the more the universe seems comprehensible the more it seems pointless uh, i i made a joke once about this quote because i wrote a, a review on string theory and at the end I quoted this, he said that the universe seems pointless when it may be full of, of, of extended objects like strings and brains and so. I sent it to Steve and he didn't reply, so I don't know if he liked the joke. Uh, but then, well, he had all this, uh, I mean, this, all this, uh, many of his books or interviews, he had made, say all these things. It shows that he cared not only about the science, but the role of science in general. He had, he was not a, uh, scared or, 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 or uh, uh, he did, nothing stopped him to say what he thought, even if it was controversial or not. And even if you agree or not, you have to say that his resonance, his logic was always uh, extremely good and, and, and he spoke with knowledge. So my favorite quotes are this, this one. This one I put in my standard model the lecture notes when I give my talks, because this is precisely what the standard model is about, and what we want to do as physicists is to describe the world as we find it, but to explain it, we need to explain it in terms of a few fundamental principles why the world is the way, the way it is. So it's, it's not it's not describing but explaining it, and 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 I think that was the whole point about fundamental physics. Um, this thing is when he was talking about um, aspects of quantum gravity. And uh, I like this one because you say a thing that uh, by far the most likely possibility is that this will be something like a string theory. I, I admire him because he tried with string theory. He worked for two or three years when I was a student also. And he stopped doing string theory, but he did not criticize it. He just said, I'm not doing string theory because it's not my style, it's becoming too mathematical or so. But that doesn't mean that he was criticizing and he was he thinking that he was thinking that that's the way to go. So he, he was very honest in that way, in that regard, because it's very easy to say. Well, I don't work in string theory, so I start criticizing it. Uh, it, it. It was not his case. And then this one is, I think, is, is a lesson for all of us. That I, and I think I like it very much. This, the mistake is not to take our theories too seriously, but not taking them seriously enough, because it's hard for us to imagine that we have uh, what we do in the calculations have anything to do with the real world. So I finish with that, and thank you very much. <clears throat> Thanks a lot. Thanks sir. a lot, sir. For this night nice, nice. and for taking us on the incredible journey of Professor Weinberg. Uh, so now mm -hmm. the forum is open for questions. So we can discuss with Professor Kuvedo anything if you have any comments or any questions. So I can see a so comment. 
professor subhi sarkar <laughs> <laughs> I, I don't want to well uh, fernando there was a fascinating talk and i i think uh, you know it's it's only when you recite them all together that one gets a sense of the Bhastic. huge range of things that uh, weinberg worked on uh, i just mm -hmm. made a comment about your remark about his uh, uh, so called prediction of the cosmological constant just to say <laughs> that the people that you wrote he specifically said Uh, that uh, there is no anthropic prediction of the cosmological constant because he noticed that uh, uh, the requirement that the cosmological constant should not stop galaxies from forming that is the physical reason as you know and galaxies don't form today they formed at a redshift of around 5 so the matter density was 5 cube times bigger than so the cosmological mm -hmm. constant could have been 100 times bigger than today and still nothing would have happened so uh, right. he actually concluded right. uh, that's why that paper is called an upper bound which is true right absolutely absolutely yes, he absolutely. didn't actually yes, say, he didn't predict it but you are right that subsequently when it became fashionable so uh, george f satyu uh, uh, came he said well you know that this is the upper bound and the minimum value is zero so the typical value is half away in between if you assume a flat prior as you mm -hmm. as they call exactly. it so then you get some number but it is still short by a factor of uh, you know 50 to 100 of yeah. of the uh, i mean it is still higher than a factor of 50 to 100 of the value that is inferred from observations because of the physical fact that um, galaxy formation is not happening now it happened at a higher redshift so uh, weinberg of course noticed that yeah yeah that's 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 fair yeah that's that Anyway, this so, is a minor. Uh, I, I, I mean, I, I think you know, given the glittering array of papers that you showed, where there are so many profound contributions, uh, I, I would personally, you know, I have other favorites amongst these papers. Let's put it that way. Absolutely no, that, no. But it's, it's 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 impressive that he he's he was brave enough. That's which I think is important to, to, yeah. to emphasize, because oh, it's yeah. something that we all have, want to keep our reputation. Absolutely. So put anthropics in a, in in a paper that is, you know. no, no, no. Well, he, he could afford to do it. Look, he, he basically wrote most of the stuff. He no, could I, I, to do. No, But no, like no. you said, he also stood up to the philosophers. I really admire him for that. That he's That's not right. going to be scared of by people saying he's a he's writing the Whig version of history and all that, right? Exactly. Saying, this is this is how we work. This is what we do. Like it or not. Absolutely. I mean, you know, yes. that's really robust. Uh, one can admire him for. Yeah, this is impressive. Yes, yes. Uh, he he enjoyed the controversy. I have to say, but on on the on the anthropic principle, he always say that he doesn't like the idea. Yeah, uh, he doesn't like the idea. But he said, well, nature doesn't have to behave in the way that I like it. <laughs> so then, anyway, so we have to say this is totally open. Thanks. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Nice to see you. So, can I say yes. something? Yeah, yes, ma'am. Yes. Uh, thanks, Fernando, for a beautiful, beautiful voyage. This was oh, you know, uh, wonderful, and one more thing which I always found, at least, and particularly after he was gone, and one sort of gave a few lectures on him. I looked at the abstracts of the different papers, and what I found amazing, and I wanted to kind of share this uh, with you and ask your feeling, is that you know even for example in the anthropic bound paper, okay, in the abstract. He also writes a line: "What may disprove his reasoning?" You know, and almost uh -huh. everywhere he he makes contacts with experiments. I mean, I was amazed that his first limit on the Higgs boson mass, which he got from the uh, lower limit on the Higgs boson from the stability vacuum stability, he did that paper in seventy-seven or something. Mm -hmm. And in the last para of that paper, then he says. you know maybe you can produce it in the neutrino reactions that are be happening at fermi lab just now and personally i remember one of his papers which got me into doing suzy phenomenology was a prl where he proved that by taking a particular form of the kinetic term uh, in the kehler potential you can actually prove that there will be one partner of the w or the z which will be lighter than the w or the z and he wrote this mm -hmm. paper in 1983 and in the abstract he writes and therefore they may one may be able to search for them in the w and the z decays 
where the Ws and the Zs have still not been seen at uh, UA1 or UA2. So I, I find this contact with enormously complex physics ideas with numbers. Something only the other person in whose work I see that is for me. You know, that you really look at mm -hmm. numbers in an order of magnitude way, numbers in a very, what, can, what is in my reach? So I found that completely amazing when I looked at it. And I hadn't realized that this was such a recurring theme, beginning from a paper in 1977 till, you know, throughout, <laughs> even in the uh, Cosme, the Anthropic Bound paper, where he says that, by the way, maybe uh, uh, galactic uh, gal evolution dynamics may disprove my uh, reasoning completely. I mean, this is... Mm -hmm. Is this is really the science. <laughs> I mean, so we can all be very yes. lucky that we can understand what he did. I mean, I myself sort of feel that I can bask in the glory of the subject that he brought so much value to. So Absolutely. I, I Absolutely. just wanted yes. to, yes. Uh, you know, and, and your talk brought that whole thing out so yes. beautifully. So thanks for uh, doing it. You know, thank, thank you very you. much. Yes. Yeah, but as you said, well, there are many things that also I also left out because uh, there is no 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 time for so many things. But but it's, uh, yes, yes, it's yes, incredible, yes. the man. And you can see that many of his papers were just by himself, which is uh, you know you can see he did everything. Yeah. And you know he even also wrote, uh, got a prizes. I didn't mention all the prizes, but he got a prize as the as a scientist as a poet <laughs> because <laughs> the way he writes, he writes. Model of Lepton's paper, the first few lines read like a textbook. Right. You know, you know just the first, they read like a textbook. Right. I mean, right, you, can, right. you can produce the whole thing in a textbook and say, this is it. And I think many of us do that. So, yes, amazing, exactly. man. <laughs> And yeah, to, yeah, to yeah. start a paper like that, you know, amazing. You know, you, it's but a conversation. I, it's just a no, conversation. I thank you for bringing all, you know, the glory out uh, very well. Thank you very much. Yeah, no, no, thank you. Thank Thanks. You. Yeah, 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 thank literally. You. When we saw the galaxy of the papers in one hour, you know, we sometimes see them, but after in one hour, you know, we saw everything, basically. Everything. Yeah. Uh, yes. That's yeah, amazing. Yeah. Uh, any comments from, you know, if you have any further comments? Uh, uh, can I ask a question? Yes, yes, uh, yes. Okay. Okay. Uh, was there any interaction between uh, another of those greats, uh, uh, Feynman and uh, Weinberg, at any time that you might recollect, mm -hmm. or, or also between Gelman and uh, uh, Weinberg? <laughs> yes, well, uh, uh, yes, I, I know. Well, they all respected each other very much. Feynman and Weinberg gave this uh, this uh, Dirac lectures here, at, and that's what the book I, I mentioned at the end. Um, this is a story that I don't know if it was true. Uh, there are all this uh, story that people mentioned that, uh, you know, in Caltech, <laughs> Gelman and Feynman were very tough, and at some point, very young Weinberg went, and they almost destroyed him, and he almost left into tears. So, <laughs> so no. people mentioned that, but I don't know the source, if it's reliable or not. But I can see, that because it's a different generation, just a few years older, Mm -hmm. And he was coming on like a rising star, and this this one well established two scientists who are very strong personalities. I'm sure I can imagine not being totally friendly to him. Uh, so, but but uh, yeah, uh, that's the only thing I I, I I have heard. But of course, they 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 they, they knew each other and they, they respected each other very very, very much. Um, is this also well? We, yeah. Um, but with Glashow, there's a story. Eh? They were classmates in high school, and then uh, classmates in the university. Then they were both go, they went both to, to to the Niels Bohr Institute, I think. So essentially, they had para parallel lives at some point, and they wrote several papers together. Mm -hmm. And then they, they shared the Nobel Prize for different reasons, which is, and uh, yes, at some point it, it, it was um, they, they stopped uh, 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 interacting, but probably Weinberg moved to Texas and so on. And, uh, Yes, I, I had the experience that that um, that I said that I had something to do with this Nobel Prize in this in '79 mm -hmm. because I was student of Weinberg and then I took Salam's job and at some point I had nothing to do with Glacio but uh, we had uh, at some point we, we we started the center in Mexico and Glacio 
uh, came to give a talk. It was the first time that Nobel Prize would give a talk in, in, in Chiapas, which is in southern Mexico. And of course, he couldn't speak Spanish. And uh, so uh, he was being translated. So at some point, the translator couldn't, couldn't follow because he was giving a talk for high school students and so on. So I, I, had, I had to take the role of the translator. <laughs> and so <clears throat> he said several things against string theory, and I had to translate them. <laughs> so I, I was disagreeing. <laughs> so I said, OK, that's my third experience with the Nobel Prize. So, so I had to translate things that I didn't like. But anyway. <laughs> And so, yes, and uh, other interactions. Well, I saw him uh, here with Hawking, with uh, Martin Rees, and so on, with uh, Frank Wilczek. Uh, uh, and I can see at that time, of course, uh, 20 years ago, that he was already above. Uh, so people would go to him to try to convince him about the, the, their ideas. And, and he was the. the okay. What about uh, when he was at Texas with uh, Sudarshan? Oh, very good. Very good. He appreciated Sudarshan very much. He thought that the, the people had been a bit unfair to him, uh, to Sudarshan sometimes. And uh, <clears throat> so uh, I, I think the relationship was very, very, very good. And and and, and, and Weinberg was very, um, uh, uh, very supportive. Actually, I can say something. It's not secret because it, it is public. Um, in ICTP, the year I arrived, uh, we gave the, the direct medal to Sudarshan and, and Kabibo, mm -hmm. and Weinberg was in the committee. And Weinberg was the one uh, 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 supporting Sudarshan all the time. So, yes, definitely, they, they, he had a great respect for Sudarshan. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Can I add a comment here? Actually? Yeah, yes, yes, ma'am. Uh, Fernando, you must be aware that uh, when he gave the talk at Sudarshan's 75th birthday, he gave a wow. talk whose title was V minus A was the key. OK. See, he basically explained what role did the V minus A theory, how basic and important V minus A theory was for setting up the standard mm -hmm. model. So the title is V minus A was the key. So we brought out a special think... issue. We brought out a special issue in memory of uh, Sudarshan last year after he passed away two years back. Oh, so we asked okay. Weinberg whether uh, he would care to write something so he indeed actually sent us the copy of that article. Mm -hmm. And he said that you can you have my permission to reprint that article because that article of mine is my mm -hmm. sort of uh, appreciation of Sudarshan as a scientist. So I thought I'll just Absolutely. share this uh, uh, with you people. Mm -hmm. yeah, that's me. <clears throat> any comments uh, or any questions? Especially students, if you have any questions, you know, uh, you can always feel free to ask because uh, you know he'll be happy to have you know you know your questions, and he will explain to you in a very nice way. Or you can write to us, and we can pass these questions to him. Uh, yes, and, and yeah, yeah. I I would like to mention that if you just just visit his website. Uh, I follow, you know, he has given in 2020 and 2021 lectures on standard model and he has a write-up basically and that is really excellent. It, it is like a mini book basically. Uh, so, uh, you know, just want to mention mm -hmm. that, that, you know, anybody can go through that and uh, I think it is amazing. It is really, uh, there are so many textbooks on standard model, but there are something that I don't find, but I do find in his lecture notes. So please, uh, because he lived in that era when things are developing as a student, then as a faculty, and then, you know, so so you can see that, you know. So uh, this is just a, just a comment. Uh, so any 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 Thank further you. comments or questions for Professor Cuvedo? Uh, I would like to uh, just uh, ask, uh, sir, that you mentioned that, uh, you know, in popularizing the science, if you can tell us, you know, the role he played, like, you know, he had everything in his basket. He worked on everything. But, you know, to 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 send this science to the basic people or to make it popular, you know, what was his role, basically, you know, especially when you are developing the science in Latin American countries, basically, you played an important role. So any role he played or, you know, any any anything he had in mind, you know, how to 
you know make it popular basically you know mm-hmm. in any comment you would like to make yes no i think he he is very pragmatic uh, you know he has uh, when when well he, when he wrote this um, article about uh, this this phrase that he said that the, the the more the universe gets comprehensible the more it gets pointless he adds that but 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 what we have in here we're giving just a, a short time to live and we have to make the best out of our lives and that's what i think he was he was doing all his life so for instance the, the first three minutes came out of a of a talk he gave in in harvard and 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 summarized giving all this information and then someone asked him oh we, we work for this editorial so would you mind making this into a book because no, nobody has seen the, that that perspective and he did it so he was not something it it, it just you know, he, his role is is, is 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 to do to was to do understand the sciences he also admired salam very much because he knew that salam was sacrificing his research for helping uh, scientists in developing countries right. and, he, and he confessed i will never do that <laughs> because he said he said he was he was his focus was always to do to do the science but at the same time you know, he wanted to 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 make it available to i would say it, it was not to the general public because he wrote i would say thinking a bit of an educated public uh, so the first three minutes i have to say i learned Cosmology reading that book. I, 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 I read something else in Cosmology later, but I read Cosmology reading that book. Uh, but also Alan Guth, who came out with inflation, confesses the same thing. He said he learned cosmology by Weinberg's book, and then he came out with the greatest discovery in, in inflation. So this this is kind of a, his way of, of having impact in the in the in the community, but uh, by, by by making <coughs> things. So the the dreams of final theory, he he wrote it because he was campaigning for this SSC, for the super col- conducting super collider at, at uh, in the United States. Right. And so he was making the case for science, how important science was. And then he was participating in, in the Congress uh, presentations and so on, just to make the case for science in general. So, <clears throat> and, and once he does that, he, 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 he wrote, he wrote those, those books. Um, and, but then he was a passionate intellectual, I would say. So he, he he is, is one of those persons that you say is fulfilled his whole life of uh, always intellectually trying to get the most of, 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 of uh, uh, his intellect. And then writing in, in this book review of, in, in, for the New York Times. Uh, that's how some of the books came out also. The, big, the one about history, because he cared about the history of science. He wanted to get in, into it and, and, and made the case. I have to say, for instance, this, uh, the history of science, he goes to the book not just telling stories. He goes and repeats the calculations. He he, he explains why Ptolemy's model was okay, was successful because it made a lot of sense at that time. And he repeats some calculations. And so he he said, you know, science was the uh, 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 he went always to 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 to, to the deepest level. Um, yes. What, what else can I say? No, I, th- I think that he was also very very honest intellectually. He didn't understand something. I say I don't understand. Period. And uh, of course, with a strong voice and personality, if he tells you that, <laughs> you feel totally uh, 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 overwhelmed. But uh, but it was this intellectual honesty is something that we all admire from him all the time. Uh, yes, uh, and sometimes your question looks simple, uh, but but it was uh, he wanted to understand. Eh? That's the point. And then you have to to, to make the best out of understanding. Um, as I said, Joe Polchinski wrote in his memoirs. He said that, that his first interaction with Weinberg was his impression was the Weinberg was a little bit slow compared to what he would have expected. But then he said, well, oh, that may be the reason why he did. He looks I mean, farther than anybody else. I mean, something that, you know, he wants to think and understand in his own way. And then uh, that's how he, 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 he built up what he, he had. So anyway, so, so I, I cannot, I always say I cannot overemphasize the admiration that I, I always had for him. <laughs> actually, uh, I always, actually, uh, I always I, I, I had I, this question I had that you worked with him as a student. So how was the atmosphere? You were scared you know, when you had to go in front of him or, you know, oh. show your calculations or some ideas. So how was the atmosphere? Yes, atmosphere? yes he was a uh, you know, the first time I said, well, uh, that, that 
I, I went to ask him, you know, I, I, I had to take these courses for two years and you have to do very well and then you can ask for an advisor. So I went, to, I finished my courses and then I went to ask him and he said, he was always in a hurry. He was, and so he stopped by and he said, okay, do you know something about the uh, Feynman diagrams? <laughs> and I said, yes. Okay, so read this book, this, the, the, read this paper and then we talk in a week. And he gave me that paper of, of supersymmetry. Oh my God. I was scared to death because I didn't know supersymmetry at that time. And he was already, you know. Uh, so I had to go and take the notes from one of my my friends on, 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 from Cliff Orges, actually, on supersymmetry. So we, I went through all the, 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 the notes and so on. And, and then came back the week after. And luckily for me, he's, he, he said, sorry, I have this meeting now. Uh, there was a, something, some conflict going on. And so he sent me to talk to, to Joe Licken. And so Joe saved my life. Then for the exam, and I said, well, can I, I have now these results with uh, Joe. Can, can I discuss them with you? He said, no, no, I'll see you in the exam. <laughs> so <laughs> you just start building up. <laughs> and then I went to the exam for the previous student. And Weinberg found a mistake right on the spot. He 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 had made some uh, analysis of finite temperature supersymmetry. And he made a mistake, conceptual mistake, and Weinberg got him there. And at the end, the student had to leave. So, and then within uh, three weeks or so, I had to give my presentation. So I was so nervous. Um, but then he was extremely friendly after that. Uh, he didn't want to ask uh, more questions. For instance, for my PhD exam, he, uh, Joel Polchiski came with a list of questions like a, of a full page of questions and uh, then everybody left after my presentation and then uh, Weinberg, uh, Joe said well I have these questions and Weinberg told him so come on Joe this is okay let's let, why don't you ask the questions later on the, 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 this this is fine and so so I was so relieved <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> and every time you know you give a talk you always feel intimidated because you know, he has this big voice Ora, and, yeah this Presence is amazing, but uh, but he was not um you know he, he he was only that his personality he wanted to understand things his own way, and he was also very humble. For instance, um, at that time, for instance, Wheaton was coming up as a big star, and Weinberg was always calling Wheaton and say, "Sorry, I don't understand. Do you want to explain us this? Or the, what did you say in that paper that we were trying to understand?" So he he was you know he said was a good leader, but also a good to the follower in that sense that uh, right. things that he didn't understand he wanted to. This thing, so <clears throat> well, there were many, 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 many stories to to tell. But it's, uh, uh... thanks a lot, sir. So, is there any comments or questions? Uh, so, if not, uh, sir, it was really a mesmerizing talk. You know, when you flash through all his contributions, you know, we could you know remember that. Okay, sometime I have seen this, sometime I have seen that, but in one basket you put together everything in one hour mm. and we are very much thankful that you accepted our invitation and you gave us this talk you know so that we can we can remember his contribution and i think you know coming years coming 100 200 years we have to live with the foundations that he has built basically and uh, mm -hmm. we need to just you know fill in the blanks basically he, he has the questions basically uh, so thanks a lot sir and i thank all of you for joining this colloquium and let us you know remember his contributions and let us just enjoy his legacy that he has left absolutely, for us absolutely. yes yes but, thanks a uh, lot and thank you very much and, uh, yeah. uh, for this thanks a lot sir. And, and thank you and you with your permission me. we'll put this video online so that you know absolutely no problem yes. thanks okay. a lot bye bye nice to see you Bye. Bye.